student loans, and bankruptcy. How to start the process. This video is a step-by-step -step guide on how to start the process on filing bankruptcy on your student loans. It provides examples of the paperwork and guides you through the process. Plus, our website has an example of the paperwork which you can customize for your situation. In order to start the process, here's what you have to do. Create and file an adversary proceeding cover sheet. Create, file, and mail three copies of an adversary complaint. Create, file, and mail three copies of a summons. Examples of an adversary proceeding cover sheet, adversary complaint, and summons are posted on our website. Adversary proceeding cover sheet. Adversary proceeding cover sheet is form B1040, and you can download this form off the court's website. The line that says adversary proceeding number. You might not have this number until you file your complaint. Remember, you are the plaintiff, and the creditors are the defendants. In the space that says defendants, put U.S. Department of Education, et al. The et al. is a way of saying that there are more defendants, without having to write every defendant's name. The attorney for the defendants will always be the United States Attorney General. In the box that states case of action, put to discharge student loans. At the bottom of the page, where the line that says demand, you put the total amount of student loans you have. Where it says relief sought, put to discharge student loans. On the second page, the parts that say bankruptcy case number and district in which case is pending and the name of judge, this information should be on the papers you received when you filed your paperwork for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. You have to file two copies of the adversary proceeding cover sheet. The rest of this form is self-explanatory. Adversary complaint. We provided an example of an adversary complaint on the website. An adversary complaint is what starts the process. It tells the other side and the court that you are filing a lawsuit. It tells them what the lawsuit is about and why you have the right to bring the lawsuit. At this stage, you are not trying to prove your case. You are just giving enough information to state that you have a case. After your lawsuit is official, then you write a brief. In the brief, you are trying to prove your case. We will review briefs later. Top heading. Look at the example of an adversary complaint. The heading will always be the United States Bankruptcy Court. However, the next line will depend on where you live. If you do not know the correct district, then ask the clerks. However, the bankruptcy case number and the district and the name of the judge should be on the papers you received from the clerks when you filed your paperwork for the Chapter 7 bankruptcy. For the parts that say defendants, creditors, write the full name of each defendant. Defendants will always be the U.S. Department of Education and Educational Credit Management Corporation. They own everyone's government student loans. You always want to put the loan servicers company and any private student loans company. You want to make sure that these companies know that you have filed for bankruptcy on your loans. Make sure that the judge's name, the trustee's name, Chapter 7 or Chapter 13 bankruptcy case number and the adversary case number is on the document like shown. For the next heading that says adversary complaint, it should all be caps, underlined, and centered. For all other headings, you do not underline them, but make sure they are centered. In addition, everything you write has to be Times New Roman font, double-spaced, and make sure each paragraph has a number. And customize it to your situation. You write, Now comes Jane Doe, debitor, plaintiff, pursuant to 11 U.S.C. Section 523-A8 and Federal Rule of Bankruptcy Procedure 7052 and 28 U.S.C. Section 1334-A and 157-A. I am requesting that my student loans be discharged. I reside at 1234 Cat Street, Wood Park, Pennsylvania, 15003, in the county of Parkwoods, in the state of Pennsylvania. Jurisdiction. For the next heading, that says jurisdiction, you do not underline this heading, or any heading after this. Just make sure it is centered. 
This is a federal question case, which means that the court has jurisdiction under 28 U.S.C. Section 1331. Just copy everything you see here. You'll write, the court has jurisdiction under 28 U.S.C. Section 1331, a case arising under the United States Constitution or federal laws or treaties. The court also has jurisdiction under federal rule of bankruptcy procedure 7052 and 28 U.S.C. Section 1334A and 157A. This court has the right, the relief that the plaintiff requested, or what the court determines to be appropriate. Parties. The next heading that says parties, you are telling the court who you are and who you are suing. This section is important because if you do not list everyone that owns or might own one of your student loans, then the loan might not be discharged. This means that even if you win, if the company that is the holder or owner of the loan is not listed here, you will still have to pay the student loan. If you do not know, then call and ask your university who is the owner of your loans. This is very important for people that attended an online college or a private college. For example, for the University of Phoenix, one of the owners of your private student loans, Apollo Education Group Incorporated. For the Cornerstone College, it might be another student loan company, such as Sally May. Sally May offers both government and private student loans. Therefore, under the heading Defendants is where you list everyone that owns your loans or might own the loan. You put down the company's name, address, and phone number. You will also list the U.S. Department of Education and Educational Credit Management Corporation. All government-backed student loans are owned by the U.S. Department of Education and Educational Credit Management Corporation. Government-backed student loans include federal direct loans, federal Perkins, student loans, parent plus loans, graduate plus loans, and direct consolidation loans. Their addresses are the following. Educational Credit Management Corporation, 21 Imitation P1, Oakdale, Minnesota, 55128. U.S. Department of Education, Department of Education Building, 400, Maryland Avenue, SW Washington, D.C. 20202 1-800-433-3243 You also want to list the servicer of your student loan, such as a Naviant or University Accountant Service. You want these companies to know that you filed for bankruptcy on your loans so that you can stop having to make payments until your bankruptcy is over. Statement of Claims Statement of Claims is where you are telling the court and the other side what the lawsuit is about and what evidence you have to support it. You do not provide any evidence at this time. There is a procedure that you must follow to submit evidence. We will review this procedure in Video 10, Student Loans and Preparing for Trial. Look at this example. Just copy everything you see here. The debitor claims the following. The debitor cannot maintain a minimal standard of living for himself and his dependents if forced to repay debtor student loans. The debtor did not willfully or negligently cause this situation. This is based on the debtor's current and future income, current expenses, employment history, medical condition, disability, education attainment, and family structure. Additional circumstances exist indicating that this state of affairs is likely to persist for a significant portion of the repayment period of the student loans. The debtor has made good faith efforts to repay the loans. The debtor meets the requirement of undue hardship as stated in 11 USC section 523A8. Relief. Next is the relief section. In this section, you are telling the court and the other side what you want. Just copy everything you see here. You'll write, I am requesting that all my educational or student loans be discharged. Certification and closing. This is the last section. Just copy everything you see here. Under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 1-1, by signing below, I certify to the best of my knowledge, information, and belief that this complaint, 1, is not being presented for an improper purpose, such as to harass, cause unnecessary delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation. Two, is supported by existing law or by a non-frivolous argument for extending, modifying, or reversing existing law. Three, 
the factual contentions have evidentiary support, or, if specifically so identified, will likely have an evidentiary support after a reasonable opportunity for further investigation or discovery. And 4. The complaint otherwise complies with the requirement of Rule 11. Now make sure your full name, address, phone number, and maybe email address is at the bottom, then sign and date, and you are finished with the adversary complaint. Summons. Summons is a document that tells the defendants that they are being sued and what the defendants have to do. Use Form 2500A. You can download this form from the court's website, www.uscourts.gov. The bankruptcy clerks use the information you put on this form to create the summons. After the clerks create the summons, they will provide you with a copy that you mail to each defendant. You fill out this form and wait until the clerks create the summons. You create a separate summons for each defendant you listed in the party section of your adversary complaint. Where it says 2, you just put the name of the defendant like shown. At the top where it says case number is the bankruptcy case number. The part that says name and address of plaintiff's attorney, put your name and address. The part where it says that the other side has 35 days to answer, since it's the federal government you are suing for student loans, means they have 60 days to answer. The clerk will correct this part. The part that says room, date, and time, this information comes from the judge assigned to your case. The judge will have the dates and times where he conducts status hearings. Most of the time, the judge will only conduct status hearings in the morning at 9 a.m. You will have many status hearings. A status hearing allows the judge to know how the case is going and if he needs to make any changes or orders to keep it moving towards trial. You can ask the clerk to help get the judge's room, date, and time information. However, if you go to your local federal court's website, you can get this information from the judge's website page. It is always good to go to the judge's webpage because each judge has their own court procedure that you will have to follow. Remember, for the status hearing, you must give them at least 60 days from the date you mail the summons. The second page of this form is where it says, Certify that service of the summons and a copy of the complaint was made. This is where you put the date you will mail the summons and the complaint. Next, check the box next to where it says, Certify mail service on, and put the name and the address of the defendant. Now, you are done. The rest of this form you do not fill out. Three things you must do. One. You must file three copies of the summons and adversary complaint with the bankruptcy clerk. 2. You must mail three copies of the summons and adversary complaint by certified mail with a delivery receipt for each defendant you listed in the party section. 3. You must mail three copies of the summons and adversary complaint to your local U.S. Department of Justice and to the United States Attorney General in Washington, D.C. by certified mail with a delivery receipt. You can find the address of your local U.S. Department of Justice on the Internet. The address for the U.S. Attorney General in Washington, D.C. is the following. U.S. Attorney General, U.S. Department of Justice, 950 Pennsylvania Avenue, N.W. Washington, D.C., 20530. Please review Video 9, Learning Disabilities and Other Medical Conditions and Disabilities and Tricks They Use to Kill Your Case. There is a lot of useful information that applies to everyone. Evidence Now is the time to gather all the evidence you need to prove your case. The evidence you will need is not limited to the following. Every case is different, so some will need more and others will need less. Pay stubs for the past two years, medical records or medical evaluations or medical assessments, divorce papers, repair estimates, rent contracts or mortgage payments, bank records for the past three years, tax returns or tax transcripts for the past two years, 
you can get a free copy of your transcripts from the IRS. Your yearly earnings. You can get a free copy from Social Security of your lifetime earnings. Jobs. All the jobs you applied for, with the dates you applied for the job, the job title, and the job description. It is very important that you sit down and think about all the jobs you have applied to and interviewed for and the dates they took place. This means all the jobs since you left college, even if it was over 20 years ago. Some judges will say that the jobs were beyond your ability. You did not apply to enough jobs. Judges use this as a method to kill your case. Showing all the jobs over the past 20 years will help you counter this method and may help you win an appeal. Newspapers, periodicals, and internet website articles. If you have a learning disability, you want to attain as many articles or information as you can that prove that a learning disability is something you are born with. If it is not diagnosed early in life, can affect you negatively in the future. Many judges believe that a learning disability is not a real disability. Please review the video 9, Learning Disabilities and Other Medical Conditions and Disabilities and Tricks They Use to Kill Your Case. There is a lot of useful information that applies to everyone. Student Loan Amount You will also need to show the court your student loan's amount, including the interest and the monthly payment amounts. Write your student loan's holder's company or the U.S. Department of Education for this information. Very important! Make sure that the information has on it what the original principal is and what the capitalized interest is. You need this information. You need the court to know that the outstanding principal is different than the original principal and how the outstanding principal is calculated. You need the court to know that the outstanding principal is the capitalized interest on the original principal. If the interest is greater than the original principal, it can play a big factor in your favor in the court's decision. Do not depend on the other side to provide this information to the court. The other side will leave out the fact that the outstanding principal is different than the original principal and how the outstanding principal is calculated. Anything that can or might help you win. Plus, just because you file these documents with the court means nothing if you do not verbally state them in your trial. Remember, you have to verbally state these documents during the trial or they mean nothing. We will review how to submit evidence in video 10, student loans and preparing for trial. We will review what to do at trial in video 12, the trial and pre-trial.